Hello, my name is Natasha Pence. I am an independent piano teacher in Covington, Kentucky. I serve as president of Northern Kentucky MTA, as well as the membership certification chairperson for KMTA. It is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Gregory Partain, who will be giving a session titled Beethoven Chameleon. For well over two centuries, perhaps no other composer has seriously challenged Beethoven's preeminence as the dominant symbol of Western classical music, nor rivaled his grip on the popular imagination. But as the world has changed, so Beethoven has changed. Beethoven Chameleon offers historical perspectives on ways his music and life have been variously understood, received, experienced, explained, rejected, embraced, feared, celebrated, and used to support artistic, political, moral, and social agendas from his time to the present. Gregory Partain has perform performed recitals, chamber music, and concertos throughout the United States, as well as Germany, Poland, Guatemala, Costa Rica, Russia, and Greece. Recent solo projects include the KMTA Conference Artist Recital in 2017, as well as Beethoven's Odyssey, a seven evening lecture recital series comprising 22 sonatas. As KMTA MTNA commissioned composer in 2005, Partain wrote Re Requiem for choir and orchestra, later performed by 200 musicians at Lexington Singletary Center. Dr. Partain received a Bachelor of Music degree in piano performance from the University of Washington, as well as doctoral and master's degrees from the University of Texas at Austin. He has taught at Transylvania University since 1991 and currently chairs their music program. Hello, and thanks for tuning in. I was excited when the conference call went out this year for Beethoven presentations to help celebrate the 250th anniversary of Beethoven's birth. Even after two and a half centuries, Beethoven is hard to ignore. Americans recognize him more than any other classical musician. Who doesn't know the scowl of the temperamental musical genius with bad hair, this utterly untamed personality, as Goethe put it? And scholars generally agree that for nearly two centuries, a single style of a single composer has epitomized musical vitality becoming the paradigm of Western compositional logic and of all the positive virtues that music can embody for humanity. But while we all have a general sense of Beethoven's importance, and we certainly respect and love his music, I suspect that many of us have only a slim grasp of how deep Beethoven's influence runs in our cultural DNA and how different our lives would be had Beethoven never come along just at the right time and place. Sure, we wouldn't have Beethoven's music to play and listen to, but also we might not have symphony orchestras in the United States. We might not have music schools offering advanced degrees. You might not be a music teacher. The Beethoven phenomenon helped ignite a major rethinking in Europe then in America about the seriousness of music and its potentially life transformative power. This three-part presentation will take us a step closer to understanding the immensity of Beethoven's impact on our music, our culture, and our lives. First, we'll sprint through what I'm going to call the core narrative. Part fact, part myth, it remains the dominant Beethoven story that most impacts how most of us experienced his music. In part two, we'll see how Beethoven's looming presence shaped America's musical landscape in the 19th century. In the last part, let's call it shimmering images, we'll move into the 20th and 21st centuries to look at ways that performers, scholars, and popular culture have dealt with Beethoven, sometimes embracing him, sometimes challenging the traditional core narrative in astounding ways. I'll draw especially on these three sources, which I strongly recommend to you. Comini's The Changing Image of Beethoven, Michael Broyles' Beethoven in America, and Jan Swafford's Beethoven, Anguish and Triumph. They deal with Beethoven in wide contexts, and I hope these are all on your bookshelf. We're going to see that the more we learn about this beloved icon, the more he slips through our fingers because truly Beethoven is a chameleon. So what do I mean by the core narrative? I mean that remarkable story that starts out here 
and ends up here with Beethoven revered by millions around the planet as a demigod. The core narrative includes fact, legend, and exaggeration, the perfect ingredients for a powerful cultural myth. As you know, the essential story begins with Beethoven's childhood in Bonn, Germany, a hotbed of progressive enlightenment thinking. Ludwig was born in 1770, his father a competent court musician, his mother Maria a nurturing soul, his main teacher Herr Neffe in keyboard and composition, an inspiring man of many talents and a wide reputation. The young Ludwig had friends and supporters who recognized his talents, despite his sometimes withdrawn personality. Not a bad way for a composer to start. But remember, we like to tell this as the tale of a suffering artist who rose from near obscurity to change the world. So we have to be sure to include the stories of his father's heavy handedness and the fact that Maria died of TB when Beethoven was 16. When his father turned to heavy drinking and lost his position, Beethoven became head of the family and took care of his two younger brothers. In the next phase of our hero's journey, Beethoven moves to Vienna, Europe's musical capital, where he'd planned to study with Mozart, but that musical god died the year before, so Beethoven had to settle for the second best, Franz Joseph Haydn, the most famous musician alive. Again, not bad circumstances for an ambitious musician. With decent financial backing from multiple patrons, Beethoven does well. He makes a splash as a pianist. Performing in salons becomes his main livelihood. His playing is more physical, more brash than the polite style the Viennese are accustomed to. He seems to tap into some deep source, especially when improvising. He attracts friends and important supporters. He has romantic relationships, none of which end well, and they never will for the rest of his life. Beethoven makes headway as a composer, too. This headstrong, intelligent young man learns best on his own by studying intensely the works of Mozart and Haydn and many others. He masters the classical musical language of the day and is taken seriously as a first-rank composer. The classical ideal holds that music is an innocent luxury unnecessary indeed <clears throat> to our existence, but a great improvement and gratification to the sense of hearing. <clears throat> but sometimes Beethoven asserts a wilder spirit in his music, and that's a foreshadowing of things to come. By his 30th year at the turn of the century, Beethoven has written and published a first symphony and many other successful works. He makes a secure income by performing, supplemented by composing, and his future seems assured. But then it happens, what Jan Swafford calls the hammer blow. It's the great turning point of Beethoven's life and a crucial element of the core, core narrative. He finds that his hearing is failing, not all at once, but there's no denying it. Just imagine the anguish for a musician. In 1802, in the country village of Heiligenstadt, he writes a moving confessional letter to his brother, but never sends it. It's discovered only after its death, his death. In it, he writes, ah, I would have put an end to my life only art withheld me. That's the cry of a new kind of artist, a romantic artist, a creator who must create because destiny calls, no matter the cost to this suffering soul. Rather than crumble before God and man, Beethoven rises to the challenge. I shall seize fate by the throat, he proclaims, and proceeds to reinvent himself and his compositional style. In Beethoven's so-called heroic decade, he produces the revolutionary masterpieces that would change music forever. Remember the Third Symphony, 
nothing less than the greatest single step made by an individual composer in the history of music. A feat of fiery imagination, a fling at the universe. Or there's the Appassionata, where the human soul asked mighty questions of its God and received its reply. Beethoven at this time embraces the personal and musical challenges. For without suffering, he believes, there can be no struggle. Without struggle, there can be no victory. And without victory, there can be no crown. On and on it goes, from one groundbreaking, genre-expanding masterpiece to another. It's a white-hot decade, one of the most fertile periods of any artist in any medium at any time. He churns out symphonies, piano sonatas, string quartets, concertos, an opera, and so on. It can be difficult for listeners to make sense of some of this music. It's no longer mere entertainment, but requires a new, deeper way of listening, romantic listening, willingness to surrender to music's power. And know well, it is your fault alone if you do not understand the master's language as the initiated understand it, and that the portals of the innermost sanctuary remain closed to you. These are not Beethoven's words, but Beethoven did teach us to regard difficulty in art as a good thing. In the words of one 19th century musician, Beethoven taught us the poetry of music. His compositions awakened in us the first consciousness of the dignity and significance of our profession. Beethoven in his prime, the romantic hero. Then in his final years, a mellowing, less raging at the universe, a retreat into silence and his small circle of friends. There's plenty of erratic behavior toward the outside world, to the point that some thought he'd gone crazy, but sometimes too, a wise recognition, an acceptance and resignation, a spirituality and transcendence. Twenty thousand people attended Beethoven's funeral in 1827, and in the famous eulogy, the myth-making took wing. It was only the beginning. Part two takes us to America, where that core narrative began transforming the musical landscape of a new nation. To the best of our knowledge, Beethoven arrived on our shores in 1805 in Charleston, South Carolina. Of course, I mean that Beethoven's music arrived. A center of trade in rice and slaves, Charleston was a city of social refinement. One special concert conducted by a German-born musician almost certainly began with the movement of the first symphony, probably in a pared down chamber version for nine players. The second performance took place in Nazareth, Pennsylvania in 1813. Again, probably some of Symphony No. 1 arranged for nine parts. Between 1813 and 1820, we find references to random performances of Beethoven's symphonic music here and there. The third known public performance took place in Lexington, Kentucky. Think of that. With 5,000 people, including the 1,500 slaves, Lexington was the largest city west of the Allegheny Mountains and a cultural center. A major Beethoven work had not yet been heard in New York, Philadelphia, or Boston, the largest cities of the nation. One Anthony Heinrich, an Austrian immigrant, conducted the Lexington performance. He would later be called Beethoven of America. And I'm thrilled that later today, Dr. Janet Smith will be telling us everything there is to know about this fascinating character. 
Though performances of his music were scattered and few in the 1820s and 30s, Beethoven was seeping into American culture. Remember, there were no standing orchestras, except for the occasional large city theater ensemble. Military bands were the only instrumental music organizations. If you heard a symphonic uh, movement at all, it was typically played by a small makeshift band and adapted to the instruments at hand. Meanwhile, piano ownership was skyrocketing among the wealthy and semi-wealthy, and nearly every young lady of any distinction learned to play and sing. It's likely that Beethoven was heard regularly in salons, but mainly his easier incidental pieces. The first known semi-public performance of a Beethoven piano sonata was in Boston in 1819 by the 20-year-old Sophie Hewitt. By far the, most, the work most responsible for Beethoven's growing reputation in America in these decades was the Hallelujah Chorus from his oratorio, Christ on the Mount of Olives. Not one of Beethoven's most inspired works, but perfect fair for the many choral societies springing up all over in the new nation. <clears throat> Despite this limited exposure, more and more people were beginning to hear about Beethoven's reputation, even if they did not yet know his music. Beginning in the 1840s, one factor contributed more than any other to Beethoven's growing reputation in America, and that is the development of symphony orchestras. And take note here, without Beethoven's symphonies, our first orchestras in Boston and New York would likely never have gotten off the ground and might not be around today. One musician recalled that it was frequent repetition of Beethoven's fifth that created a living bond of union between audience and performers, an initiation into a deeper life. And that's what kept the audience coming back time after time. In Boston, where the orchestra consisted of 25 to 30 of the city's best players, listeners heard the Fifth Symphony 12 times in seven years and the Pastoral Symphony nine times. In New York, Beethoven performances far outstripped those of other composers. In these crucial 1850s, Americans in major cities started to grapple with the meaning of music, its role as art, its place in society. And if you don't believe that Beethoven was already at the center of those questions, who do you think is sitting up here watching over everything? Beethoven needed passionate champions, influential writers and musicians to shape mainstream public opinion and teach Americans how to experience his music. I'll tell you about three shining figures. From the 1840s on, Margaret Fuller and John S. Dwight presented Beethoven as a spiritual force, a primal force, and tied him to notions of America's untamed wilderness. Fuller worked in Boston, then in New York as editor of the New York Tribune. Her high-flying language primed list listeners for Beethoven. Here with force, she wrote, in wise blaze of light and high heroic movement, more power flows with bolder joy, with a sorrow more majestic. New swells of triumph precede powers still profounder, worthy to precede the birth of worlds. And a divine intelligence showers down the sun and shadow from an equal height. But more than anyone, John Dwight defined Beethoven for mid-century Americans, and his writings elevated music to a high art ideal. Dwight's Journal of Music ran from 1852 to 1881 and produced over a thousand issues. Dwight labeled most music mere entertainment. It cannot enrich, ennoble, purify, and perfect the powers and sensibilities of man, he said, whereas true music is elevating, purifying, love and faith inspiring. God's voice could be heard most clearly in instrumental music, Dwight believed, specifically in the symphonies of Beethoven. 
Are not Beethoven's slow movements almost the very essence of prayer, he asked? Not formal prayer, but earnest, deep, unspeakable aspiration. Is not his music pervaded by such prayer? When you have heard Beethoven, you are a changed man. Encouraged and educated in this way, more and more Americans hungered for music that offered more than mere entertainment. Enter our third major 19th century champion, Theodore Thomas, violinist, conductor, the most powerful musician in America in the late 19th century. At various times, he was music director of the New York Philharmonic, the American Opera Company, the Cincinnati May Festival, director of the Cincinnati Conservatory of Music, director of the Chicago Symphony, you get the idea. Thomas declared that the man who does not know Shakespeare is to be pitied, and the man who does not understand Beethoven and has not been under his spell has not half lived, lived his life. Shortly after the Civil War, when Thomas took a 40-piece professional orchestra on tour, he discovered that residents in many of the smaller Midwestern towns preferred hearing serious repertoire over light fare. And we can well imagine the novelty and impact of hearing a Beethoven symphony performed well by professionals in that era before sound recordings. Thanks to these three passionate champions, a Beethoven performance in 19th century America became more than a musical event. It became an uplifting experience, a moment of transcendence and commun communion with the Almighty himself. Beethoven was in America to stay. Finally, let's see how 20th century Americans brought Beethoven into the new modern age. By 1927, the, the centennial of Beethoven's death, Americans and Europeans had come to view Beethoven, if not as a god, at least as a pure moral being who dwelled on a higher plane. At the top of the main stairway of the New York Metropolitan Museum of Art, and acquired that centennial year. This large bronze bust of Beethoven brooded majestically and prominently. The base reads, I am Bacchus who presses for men the delicious nectar. There were commemorative events throughout the Western world in 1927. In the US, a committee of 22 college presidents and educators formed to coordinate celebrations in 500 cities with concerts, lectures, and commercial recordings released. The committee published a sermon on the religious aspects of Beethoven's music, and also an address on the civic influence of music. And these were distributed to religious and civic leaders throughout the country. The Musical Quarterly acknowledged that Beethoven has become a religion. It is a matter of historical fact that Beethoven, more than any other musician, brought about that religious attitude towards music in general, which has been prevalent for half a century or more in Teutonic and Anglo-Saxon countries. Let's look briefly at how three 20th century writers interpreted the spiritual aspects of Beethoven's music. First, a particularly influential little book that appeared during that centennial year, Beethoven, His Spiritual Development. J.W.N. Sullivan, a mathematician, argued compellingly that Beethoven's development as a composer was fueled by his development as a human being. And furthermore, that Beethoven's acceptance of suffering was the key to his music's deep spirituality. In his late string quartet, Sullivan said, Beethoven entered a new phase in which he moved beyond human suffering, living in an isolated world apart from ordinary human life, alone with his thoughts and his inner sounds. The late quartets are a manifestation of the final step in a spiritual journey, whereupon Beethoven has arrived at a state of almost mystical consciousness. Henceforth, he voyaged in strange seas of thought, alone. Beethoven believed that, uh, Sullivan believed that Beethoven's late music 
could open us up to a higher plane of consciousness. As the opening movement of the Opus 131 string quartet um, gives an example, Sullivan says, it seems to reveal an unsuspected possibility of the mind to communicate to us a state of consciousness hardly analogous to anything we have previously experienced. Sullivan's vision of Beethoven as a wise spiritual guide for truth seekers remains influential among many performers and writers, including some who speak in more overtly religious terms. Here are two fascinating examples. Corinne Helene's Beethoven's Nine Symphonies correlated with the Nine Spiritual Mysteries and Beethoven and the Spiritual Path by David Tame, the latter published by the Theosophical Publishing House. I suppose you could call Helene and Tame New Age theorists. Like Sullivan, Tame believes that Beethoven is capable of revolutionizing our consciousness because Beethoven's music uplifts our spiritual centers, our chakras. He writes, it transforms who we are. The consciousness of God exists in Beethoven's music, which the listener absorbs. His deafness allowed him to hear the anahata, the unstruck cosmic sound. Thus, the sounds of Beethoven are the sounds of the universe. Helene is a Rosicrucian. For her, the nine symphonies represent the nine spiritual mysteries, initiatory steps through which each aspirant must pass in his or her quest for wisdom. You might hear some echoes of Freemasonry in there. She combines many numerological and astrolo uh, astrological elements in her interpretation. The Ninth Symphony represents the pinnacle, a consummation. For both Helene and Tame, Beethoven, the artist creator, is a vessel through which cosmic wisdom reaches the world. Beethoven's music is not the creation of a human mind, they claim. No, it is celestial music, to use Helene's terms. Music from outer space that Beethoven brought down to earth and translated for human beings. Now, what were professional musicians saying about Beethoven in the 20th century? Specifically, how could Beethoven survive as the emotional excesses and indulgences of 19th century romanticism were given way to the rising tide of modernism? Because modernists had a choice, either abandon Beethoven or find a way to take him into the fold. Their answer? They redefined him. In academia, it became fashionable to downplay the emotional romantic aspects of Beethoven's music and admire instead Beethoven's integrity and mastery of design, where every note belongs and relates to a grand scheme. Analysts began celebrating Beethoven's devotion to musical structure so concise and logical and rigorously thematic. Beethoven the Romantic became, voila, Beethoven the Classicist. Beethoven was grounded in classicism. He never shook the formal foundations and principles of classical music or broke them, broke them down, the eminent musicologists now declared. A musical quarterly article in 1930 taught that in Beethoven's music, law and order prevails and obedience to the intellect and regulative reason. The author found that Beethoven relied supremely on the masculine powers of formulation. In the next generation, American musicologist and pianist Charles Rosen picked up the torch and argued that Beethoven indeed enlarged the limits of the classical style beyond all previous conceptions, but he never changed its essential structure or abandoned it. No rebellious revolutionary there. Well, how could this be? For a century, Beethoven had embodied the idea of self-expression in music and autobiography made audible. What were performers to do with this new image of Beethoven as classicist? Well, of course, they would evolve new ways of delivering the familiar masterpieces, more authentic performances, as they put it, 
where the performer gets out of the way and allows the music to speak for itself. Toscanini was a famous early advocate of this approach. And high fidelity recording technology furthered a new emphasis on precision and clarity in performance. Add in the early music movement, especially beginning in the 1980s, when musicians like Roger Norrington, John Elliott Gardner, and Malcolm Bilson brought a freshness to repertoire from the late 18th and early 19th centuries. Beethoven sounded different now. More authentic? Maybe in some ways, though authenticity is a moving target. Meanwhile, everyone, the public, performers, and analysts continued to consume Beethoven. Let's look at some of the stats. From 1940 to 1970, Beethoven comprised 10 to 12 percent of the repertoire performed by 27 major U.S. orchestras and 18 percent for the New York Phil. By 1950, there were 329 commercial recordings available. Today, some 40,000 commercial recordings are available, not counting YouTube. And the starting redefinitions of Beethoven continued. If you think you know what Beethoven's music means, ask these controversial feminist writers of the late 20th century, poet Adrian Rich and American musicologist Susan McClary. Traditionally, the core narrative would have us understand the strength and violence and aggression in Beethoven's music as positive attributes. As E.T.A. Hoffman famously wrote, the Fifth Symphony opens us up to the gigantic and the immeasurable. Glowing beams shoot through this kingdom's dark night, bringing horror, fear, dread, suffering, and, awaken, and uh, awakening the pain of that infinite longing that is the essence of Romanticism. We're encouraged to surrender to that power. For Adrian Rich, Beethoven elicits horror, all right, a horror of masculine aggression. As her poem, The Ninth Symphony of Beethoven, understood at last as a sexual message, explains, for her, the Ninth Symphony portrays a man in terror of impotence or infertility, not knowing the difference. She writes that it is music of the entirely isolated soul yelling at joy from the tunnel of the ego. It is music without the ghost of another person in it. Music trying to tell something the man does not want out, would keep if he could, gagged and bound and flogged with cords of joy, where everything is silence and the beating of a bloody fist upon a splintered table. For McClary, as analyst author Michael Broyles explains, Tonality itself embodies male sexual desire with its relentless push to the climax. Western musical structures are based on the notion of frustrated desire. Even a cadence is a sexual event approached through desire, fulfilled through release. But if release is withheld too much, as when the recapitulation of the ninth's first movement arrives, the carefully prepared cadence is frustrated damming up energy, which finally explodes, and these are McClary's words, in the throttling, murderous rage of a rapist incapable of attaining release. So is that what Beethoven really means? You are free to choose your metaphors. But violence in Beethoven is a very fruitful topic. Some of you will remember Stanley Kubrick's controversial use of Beethoven's Ninth in this film, and you can read Michael Broyles' book, Beethoven in America, for a brilliant analysis. A Clockwork Orange provides an excellent segue into the next short topic. Beethoven has appeared in more movies than any other composer, and how could any filmmaker resist the pull of the Beethoven core narrative? There's tragedy, triumph, genius, rebellion, the immortal beloved mystery, and always the specter of his deafness. 
not to mention great music for a soundtrack. But the attraction began in the silent film era with this three minute treatment. Every film emphasizes different aspects of the composer's life and personality. Like all of us, directors and writers must choose where to shine their brightest light. In the French film, um, Beethoven's Great Love, Beethoven is the long suffering, thoughtful artist, subject to sudden mood swings. In Immortal Beloved, Beethoven is temperamental and angry, but mainly he's extremely amorous. He's the great lover, a regular Don Juan figure who uses his music to make his conquests. As one character says, his music affected me like nothing I had ever heard before. I heard that Beethoven's music aroused such passion as to be dangerous. Some thought it obscene and unsuitable for the young. More recently, copying Beethoven centers on the composer's last years especially the week before the premiere of the Ninth Symphony, when a copyist comes to the apartment to help him with final score preparation. She's a young woman, of course, Anna, who tells Beethoven she's also a composer. He replies, a woman composer is like a dog walking on his hind legs. It's never done well, but you're surprised to see it done at all. Beethoven in this telling is intimidating, unpredictable, crude, cruel, and sarcastic, but also thoughtful about art. All of these films play loose with historical facts, and plenty of critics jumped up to defend the historical record. A critic of copying Beethoven declared, Beethoven bio is dumb, 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 dumb. And Beethoven scholar Lewis Lockwood titled an essay about Immortal Beloved, film biography as travesty. He lamented that most people won't know what's authentic or not. But again, what is authentic when it comes to Beethoven? As the ever perceptive Michael Broyles points out, the choices each director makes in plot, tone, and even music are an illumination of the figure of Beethoven and in virtually every instance of what art is and what it means to be an artist. And those are questions that Beethoven and his music have inspired all along. Not that they're the only intriguing questions. For example, have you ever wondered in your heart of hearts, was Beethoven black? That question was in the air a lot during the 1960s through the 80s when the Afrocentrism movement became more mainstream in American culture. In a controversial 1963 interview in Playboy magazine, Malcolm X explained Afrocentrism's basic tenet, that Western history written by white historians leaves out or whitens up many people of color. As examples, he named Columbus, Jesus, and of course, Beethoven. As Black Panther activist Stokely Carmichael put it, the problem is that our black culture is not legitimized. They have always stolen ours. That's a fact. The blues ain't theirs. Come on, be serious. Ha, don't let them get away with that. We might let them get away with Bach. Beethoven was black. They won't tell you that in school. He was a Spanish Moor, black as you and I, but they don't tell us that. It is calculated. So was Beethoven black? It certainly might seem so in this engraving of the composer at age 34, a depiction that particularly pleased Beethoven as a particularly close likeness. Of course, engravings can be reproduced in different shades. But still, notice the curly hair and the facial features. And there are several contemporary accounts of Beethoven's rounded nose, his swarthy look, 
even his black brownish complexion. Journalist and Afrocentrist scholar Joel Rogers based his argument on Beethoven's physical appearance and on the fact that Beethoven's ancestors came from Belgium, a land controlled by Spain in the 16th and 17th centuries. Through military occupation, it's entirely possible that Moorish blood slipped into Beethoven's family line several generations before he was born, as it did for many Flemish citizens. What fascinating issues the question raises. What is race anyway? Definitions have always been fluid. What defines race versus ethnicity? And would it matter if Beethoven is black? If it matters, is it simply a political statement? One or the other, Beethoven has prevailed because he is embraced by all sides. Let's take a brief look at one last arena with a few examples of Beethoven's presence in pop music genres. Was he a friend or a foe to pop musicians? The record is mixed. You'd have to say friend if you listen to the John Kirby swing band of the 1940s. If you don't know this, you really need to go listen to this. It's a reimagining of the Moonlight Sonata Presto and Seventh Symphony slow movement. And there's Beethoven um, at the end of the arrow again, by the way. Naturally, jazz and the classics caused some critics grave concern. The president of the Bach Society of New Jersey formally requested that the FCC make the swinging of masterpieces a misdemeanor punishable by suspension of license on the first offense and revocation of license on the second. And don't miss his racist undertones. All the beautiful effects were destroyed by the savage slurring of the saxophones and the jungle discords of the clarinets. But criticism came from within the jazz community as well. Count Basie put it simply, I'll not go on the air if I have to resort to those beautiful compositions for my swing material. While he apparently respected Beethoven, he sure didn't need him. Less reverently, Chuck Berry's Roll Over Beethoven. You know my temperature's rising and the jukebox is blowing a fuse. Roll over Beethoven and tell Tchaikovsky the news. A few decades later, the ever adaptable Beethoven moved from swing and rock and roll to disco with Walter Murphy's A Fifth of Beethoven, released in 1976. Murphy and Beethoven reached number one on the Billboard charts. They got another boost the next year when The Fifth of Beethoven was featured in the movie Saturday Night Fever. Pop musicians can't seem to get enough of Beethoven. More recently, what genre would you suppose has shown particular affinity to Beethoven? Heavy metal, of course. Groups in America, Europe, and Scandinavia have all released high intensity versions of Beethoven's best known works. Everything from the Ode to Joy and Fifth Symphony to the Moonlight and Pathetic Sonatas and Fear Elise. One heavy metal artist stands out as the most heavily invested in Beethoven, the artist known as the Great Cat. Her website bills her as the famous Juilliard violin, uh, graduate violin virtuoso turned guitar shredder, metal messiah, reincarnation of Beethoven. Her act is very loud with blistering guitar riffs accompanied by screams and delivered by an aggressive hyperdominatrix persona. I highly recommend you check her out or any number of the other hair-raising heavy metal renditions of Beethoven on YouTube, especially the Moonlight Sonata. It's a paradox, really, this love-hate relationship that rock and heavy metal have with the great composer. Apparently, they identify with Beethoven the rebellious countercultural genius, the rock star of the Napoleonic era, but don't they also want to demolish the pedestal of elite culture upon which Beethoven sits? Ah, Beethoven. Let me tie this packed presentation together. 
I suggested at the beginning that the more we learn about Beethoven, the more he slips through our fingers. For who is Beethoven really? A romantic hero? Most definitely, that's the core narrative. At the same time, is he a rigorous classicist? Certainly that too. Is he spiritually inspirational? I would hope so. A new age guru? That depends on the language of your spirituality. Was Beethoven a rebellious rock idol? Sure, in some ways. Was he a dead European <clears throat> white man? As you like. Could Beethoven even be a metaphorical rapist? Well, that one too, I leave to you. I leave it all to you. But I'll close with this observation. When we understand and experience Beethoven and his music in the traditional way, informed by the core narrative, his life and music reflect our loftiest aspirations. We remember the struggles and triumphs of Beethoven's life. And it's these larger than life, mythical dimensions of Beethoven's story that lift us up as you listen to a piece like the Fifth Symphony, you feel the presence of a commanding life force. Behind the notes, we sense a personality with an iron will and an indomitable spirit, an individualist, a hero. Experienced this way, the music models a robust approach toward living the life before us, no matter what hand we are dealt. It encourages us to adopt a noble and hopeful attitude, an attitude of achievement through heroism in spite of suffering. Beethoven inspires us to face life's obstacles head on. He argues that it's best to approach diversity from a position of courage and dignity rather than to live our lives defensively. He teaches us to live without pessimism, cynicism, or fear. The music tells us that we can take control of our destiny. It's a powerful message that resounds as fully today as two centuries ago. And I thank you for listening. <laughs>